Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from the offices of Greg Wright, law offices of Greg Wright, the show that puts you, the listener, in the driver's seat because you are the content. The phone lines are open to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1 855 450 NOAA. That's 1 855 450 6624. Hey, give me a call and we'll have a conversation about your tech questions or business and tech questions. Linux Advocate, above all else, small business owner, now host of the only radio show centered around you, the listener. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. My name is Noah Chalaya. Good evening to you all, and thanks for taking the time to be here. We have an exciting show, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Of course, we're taking your calls. 1-855-450-NOAH. That's 1-855-450-6624. Jeremy starts us off this hour in South Carolina. Hi, Jeremy. What's up? Oh, not too much. Um, uh, so uh, thanks for coming to the uh, Southeast Linux Fest this year. And uh, I wanted to get a really early jump on you since you're so hard to reach, yet so easy to reach specifically on this show, and see what it would take <laughs> to have you come back to self for next year, but this time do around-the-clock video streaming as well. Oh, all right, Jeremy. Let me, all right, let's talk business. Okay, all right, let's do it. Let's talk business. Okay, so here's the thing, Jeremy. <laughs> Here's the thing. You're going to like this. You're going to like where I'm going with this. Here's the thing. The thing is, the world record for a radio broadcast is only 72 hours. And if you know anything about Noah Chalaya, what you know is Noah can work on little sleep for long periods of time. I think we could break 72 hours. How would you feel if instead of a 24-7 stream, what if we did, what if we did, what if I came down Thursday, set up, we set up Friday or whatever, and we went all day Friday, all day Saturday, and all day Sunday, nonstop? Absolutely. All right. Yeah, that's what I, that, cuz that's what I'm thinking. So here's what we could do. And I don't know you said um, you said we got we already got the go ahead from the network team? Yep. So we're good to go on that end. So really all all we'd have to do is we'd have to we could put like a couple different uh we could put a couple different devices in like the various rooms to pull from the uh you know pull from the talks and stuff like that. And if Paul Jones is doing his great uh, his great presentation, we'll have him on again. And uh and yeah, and then we could just anchor the thing back at the booth and have like a self the self could be the first conference that is that would be hosting the world's longest radio broadcast. How would that be for getting people into Linux? That's, we have a Guinness Book of World apropos. Record. We broke a Guinness Book of World. Yeah, they'll see not only um, just how late the attendees are up and at it, but they'll see how late the organizers are up and at it. Because even at four a.m. most nights, there's going to be something going on in that hallway. <laughs> That is awesome. That is awesome. I am all for this, Jeremy. Well, I tell you what, you know how to reach me. We, you, you and I are we're good friends. You, you've got me. Uh, you've got me on on various uh, on various different uh, types of, uh, of of social connections. So you know, reach out to me and, and we'll we'll set something up. But you you have my word right here on the Ask Noah Show. Uh, you know, just a couple weeks after self concludes, we are definitely going to do uh, a a twenty four hour stream. I want to make it a seventy two. I want to break a world record. Go big or go home, man. Chaz is joining us from New York. Hey, Chaz, what's up? Hey, Noah. Uh, so I am running the Solus edition, or the, rather the GNOME edition of Solus, which I really like. And uh, I ran into some problems with Skype a, of weeks ago. I uh, got them fixed. fixed it, it seems that it only runs if I have my VPN active. But while I was troubleshooting, I came to the conclusion of, God, this would be so much easier if people used an open source video program instead of Skype. Uh, so my question yes. to you is, how do we as Linux advocates uh, convince people to abandon proprietary software and take the leap on something that'll run a little better for us? Because I feel like we're kind of Microsoft selling Zoom. No one can deny we got a great product, but people have been using iPods for so long that they really don't have any desire to switch, let alone interest. Yeah, it's interesting you asked me this question of this week of all weeks because I've been spending, and you're going to find out in the rest of the program, we're going to talk about it a little bit, but I've been spending my the, the last couple of days living this exact challenge. And, and the reality is, I think what, what it comes down to is we really, there are two ways you can approach a problem. The first way is the technical 
side where we look at the science and we look at the technical details behind it. We try to decide what technically makes sense based on technical merit alone. What should the end user do? And, and, and as geeks and as, as IT professionals, I think we're very good at that. I think we're very good at analyzing the technology and saying this is technically superior. What I think gets lost on us sometimes is the social aspect and the reality that the personal computer is in fact personal and there are people behind these things and those people uh, are subject for better or for worse to the fallacies of, of, of everything that makes us human. And, and so sometimes we find these market realities of, you know, like you said, everyone wants an iPod even though – you know, some of us can make an argument that the Zune is, is a technically superior way to go. And the, I found two things that have been very, very successful. The first way is where you, where you look at the, 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 not just the technical advantages, but how that translates into real world progress. So for example, if, if you have an office and they have, you know, 16 computers and they're looking at office suites and you say, well, we could upgrade to the newest version of Office 2017. I happen to price it out today. It's $500 per machine. Or you could look at LibreOffice just released their new uh, office suite that incorporates the ribbons if you turn them on, not on by default. <laughs> but you can turn these ribbons on and get a very similar, if not identical experience to the latest version of Microsoft Office, except the software is provided at absolutely no cost. And so even if you factor in, um, you know, supporting the company that produces the software or, you know, in our case, the case VoltaSpeed, you know, there is a charge for us to come out and actually install that stuff um, or set that stuff up. Even if you factor that in, your bottom line is still better off and you're still able to get the same work done. So that's one way I approach it. The second way I approach it is the living by example, right? I get customers all the time and they'll look at my laptop and they'll go, gosh, man, you bought that laptop five years ago and you're still using it. How do you do that? How do you, how do you, how do you drag so much life out of your computers and how, how do you keep them so fast and, and responsive? And I say, well, I'm not using Windows, so it doesn't break every two years, you know? And so, I, and, and so living through example that way, um, you're able to really make a demonstration to people uh, on, on why uh, proprietary software is a real pain and, uh, and, and the advantages that free and open source stuff has to offer. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I mean, I was really just looking for a way to go about it that doesn't cause Linux users to become the Jehovah's Witnesses of the computer community, if that mm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if yeah, and and so to that end, what I would say is stick to stick to the pragmatic side. Then stick to the fact that we have. Um, Stick to the fact that we have, you know, I was, I was talking to a couple of coworkers and a client today, and I was just talking about this. And we're going to, again, we're going to get into this a little bit deeper in the program. But there are things that Windows is good at, and there are things that Windows is not good at. And there are things that Linux is good at, and there's things that Linux is not good at. And, and so it, when you're trying to sell a specific solution, what you do is you, you look at the situation and you say, where are the problems? And I'd say nine out of ten times, those problems are going to be solved with some aspect of what Linux can do better than alternative operating systems. In this particular case, uh, you know, I, I've been dealing with stability. I keep my finger on the pulse of anything that Mozilla touches. So when I heard that our next guest was teaming up with Mozilla to start a podcast about the internet, I had to make some time immediately on the Ask Noah show. Joining me this hour, gadget lover, blogger, and podcaster, Veronica Belmont. Welcome to the Ask Noah show. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Thanks for taking the time to be here. So You've been in the media space for quite a while, and you've done a number of different shows on a number of different media outlets. Tell me about this new show. Why did you want to do the show? Why now? You know, it's funny. Yeah, I've been podcasting for the past, oh gosh, 10, 12 years possibly. I believe I started back in, in 2006 or 2005. And yeah, I've worked for a lot of different outlets. I've worked for CNET. I've worked for Engadget. Um, I've done things independently, uh, continued to do so with my other show, Sword and Laser. Um, and Mozilla came to me probably last winter, this past winter. And I had already kind of moved on a little bit. I had, I had taken a full-time job as a product manager for a startup here in San Francisco. And I was like, oh, I don't really have time to, to do another project. But I really love Mozilla and I really love the idea of this show. And we just started chatting back and forth about it. And I was like, this is this is a problem that really needs to be addressed. Internet health, security, all the issues surrounding our online lives. This is a story that I feel like is being told, but I really wanted to dive into it. Yeah. And so mo who better to lead that front than a company like Mozilla, who, you know, has been at the forefront of the open web for a long time? When does the podcast start? Where can people find it? 
So we're launching on June 26. It's going to be releasing every two weeks. Um, you can already download uh, the trailer and subscribe to the show at IRLpodcast.org. Um, it's going to be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, you know, whatever RSS reader you happen to use to subscribe to podcasts. Um, you know, personally, I love Overcast and, and Breaker. Um, but yeah, it's 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 going to be really fun, and we're we're working so hard on it. <laughs> I mean, we're really trying to show all sides of these issues, um, which is tough especially with something like net neutrality, where I don't really see both sides of the issue. I, I feel very, very passionately about an open and free internet. Uh, so, you know, it, it can be difficult, but I, I really feel like we have a lot of great stories to share. What other topics are you going to be covering other than net neutrality? Uh, we're going to be talking about data privacy, uh, security, uh, cyberbullying, surveillance. Um, in one of the first episodes, I actually talked to a, this is, I, I hope this isn't too much of a spoiler, but I talked to a private investigator who digs into me to find out what he can learn about me on the internet. Scandalous. And Yes. And I am a pretty open book and he still managed to find some things that surprised me. And I think that Hopefully that will shed a light on the fact that, you know, even when we try to keep ourselves safe and secure on the Internet, just in our day to day activities, we we put so much information out there and it's pretty incredible. OK, so let's dive into that a little bit. The Internet is a remarkable tool. Take podcasting, for example. Anyone can open up their computer and record a podcast and they can put it up on SoundCloud or YouTube. Mm -hmm. But my pseudo privileges and Spider-Man both tell me that great power comes with great responsibility. And there are people out there right now that are using the internet and they are not using it responsibly. Talk about that. Yeah, I mean, we spoke to some security experts recently for another episode, and it was kind of funny because they were saying, you know, the script kiddies out there these days, they're not as talented. I mean, I'm trying not to start any any crap with people out there. They, they're not as good as the people were maybe 10 years ago, but the tools are so much easier. And so being able to find tools that you can that you can use for ransomware or use for hacking or use for phishing or, you know, all sorts of different ways that you can find someone's information or get them to give up extra information, whether it's a tool or social engineering, is is pretty remarkable. And we're just so online via social media, via Twitter, via all the information that we're uploading to various websites for our own personal convenience. That's opening doors for, for these kinds of issues. Um, so just just being more aware of like what you're putting out there and, and what these tools are and how you can keep yourself even a little more safe is, is really important. Yeah, actually. Um, so in your teaser video, you touched on the fact that there are things on the Internet that are socially acceptable online, but they would be outright illegal in some cases in real life or in, in meat space. Things like stalking other people. Um, you use mm -hmm. the example of Tinder. I might use the example of you know Facebook even. Um, do you think that the internet encourages people to remove themselves from the consequences of their actions? And I guess what I mean by that is does it kind of diminish the idea that there is in fact a human being on the other side of that keyboard? Or do you think that we are seeing people who naturally gravitate towards – you know, creepy behavior. And now they have a mm -hmm. shroud that they can hide behind and indulge in these kinds of behaviors without the social repercussions that they would have outside the internet. I think it's all of those things, honestly. And and this is something that I've been talking about for the last 10 years, especially being someone who, who lives most of her life on the internet at this point and has had my entire career on the internet. I think the internet is a wonderful thing where you're able to find your people. Um, you know, I think people who typically aren't maybe as gregarious in person are able to find comfort and find friendship and find romance on the internet. And that's one of the wonderful things about it. The other side is that there is this shroud of being anonymous and not necessarily having to face the same social repercussions for, for saying things to people in an online forum that you would never say to someone to their face. And this is something that I think as a society we're still trying to, to grasp and trying to figure out how to deal with because we do have this, this instant forum where – I'm on Twitter. I can I can go tweet at, you know, the president or, right. you know, some I can go tweet at any number of people and I'm going to show up in their feed and whether or not they choose to see it is up to them. But I'm I have equal exposure to anyone else. And that's that's true of everyone online. Anyone who responds to me on Twitter, I'm going to see that no matter who they are or where they come from or how many followers they have typically. And so it's just it's a 
that's why it's important to be neutral, but it's also, you know, that's one of the downsides is that the filtering isn't really there. And so we're constantly bombarded with, with all sorts of comments from, from every single forum. And it's very hard to, to, to filter and figure out what's, what should float to the surface, what's valuable versus what's potentially harmful and unnecessary. Yeah, you definitely you have ultimate power meeting ultimate freedom and, and where those two mm-hmm. collide, you know, there's both good and bad can happen. You know, you talk between social media and online shopping, um, we treat our privacy very different online than we do in real life. Talk about that. I mean, we'll put our credit card number into anything really <laughs> these t- <laughs> these days. It's it's tough because we expect a certain level of, of security and privacy, um, especially during uh, transactions on the internet. You know, we, we have a certain level of trust for, for companies. But you know, that, maybe some people. Go that, ahead. Well, I was just going to say that trust is, you know, the, the bar is just so much lower online uh, for trusting somebody else online than you would if you walked into, you know, a storefront. Yeah, I mean... Yes and no. I think when you walk into a storefront, you at least are able to size up the situation online. Mm. Anyone can make a website look as good as Amazon. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. And so if you if you don't see, you know, if, if it's not a secure website, if it's not a secure form, even if it looks like a secure form, that may not necessarily be true to the average person. And so, you know, even big companies, I, I, I've been part of data breaches in the past through companies that I never would have thought would have an issue. But sometimes you find out five years later that you were part of a breach that just kind of sat on the dark net for, for ages and ages and finally came to, to light. And so really, it's just about taking responsibility to to join services like something like LifeLock, for example, or mm-hmm. to use, you know, password managers to, to make sure that all of your passwords are unique and different from one another, you know, checking to make sure that all of the third party services you have connected to your social media accounts are recent and, and making sure you turn off the ones that you don't use anymore. There's all these basic steps that we can take. But even when we do even the most secure people who are using two-factor authentication or two-step verification on, on most of their accounts, it's nearly impossible to be completely secure. So it's just about knowing really what to do next in those situations that I think is most important. And the average day person, th- this is something that IRL podcast is going to tackle. You, you, you're you going to go through and, and walk people through all of the things that they maybe didn't know that they needed to know. Yeah, it's about awareness, really. Like, exactly. Knowing what you didn't know. <laughs> Is that how you said it? That yeah. sounded really good. I'm yeah, use yeah, that. yeah, I just came up with that. You can steal it. It's okay. Okay, perfect. Uh, so you are, a, um, you are a very successful woman in the technology space. And right now there is a 15 or 16 or 17-year-old girl that is listening to the Ask Noah show. And she's listening right now. She's interested. She has a passion for technology. But she's aware that this field is heavily dominated by men. Talk to her for a moment. What advice could you give you know, a young woman coming into this field for the first time? You know, find good people to work with. Uh, I think for me, it's always been about finding mentors and other strong women who are working in the same space. And that's that's becoming, you know, it, it is difficult, but I think it's becoming more common to be able to find these these mentors and people who can kind of help you navigate uh, the space in a lot of ways. It's difficult, though. I mean, I, I did I came up in a different time. Like I, I did come up in the age of the Internet, but at the same time, it wasn't what it is now. It's a lot a lot harder now, frankly. Really? I, I really I really believe so in terms of the kind of stress that a young woman coming up in the industry has to deal with and the exposure. Um, I, I'm really glad I didn't start out as a, as a YouTube vlogger these days. Okay. Man, you have to have a really thick skin. I, I think it was one of your videos that you had, you had commented and you said, if there's one tip you can give somebody, it's don't look at the comments. That, don't read that, the comments. And that, as, as somebody who publishes a lot of, you know, online material, I, I agree with that hundred percent. It, it just, it destroys your mojo. They want to come talk to me. Definitely ping me. I will, I will give as much help as possible. It is, it's a tough space to navigate, but I think it's getting a lot better in some ways, but it is also difficult just the way that people talk to each other sure. online. It's it's hard to filter out the the good stuff from the bad stuff sometimes. Well, and that again, that's that's where this new podcast is going to come in because you're going to be setting an example, um, you know, as a, as a as a woman who is going to lead a movement essentially for internet health. 
which is great. Mm-hmm. So I, d- I don't know if anyone told you, but nobody gets on the Ask Noah show without having a conversation about Linux. So I know that you use uh, a couple different open source software platforms, and you've said numerous times that it was audio and the production of high quality audio that uh, that mm-hmm. ultimately led you into this field. And I understand that you are an Audacity user. So I am. Clearly, there are some open source. Uh, solutions that are fitting the bill in at least some use cases for you. But I got to ask, what's it going to take to get you to come to the Linux desktop full time? <laughs> you know, it's always been about gaming for me. OK, um, I, I am a PC gamer. Um, so if you guys can if you guys can compete, if I can play like, hmm, I guess I probably can play World of Warcraft on Linux, can't I? Yeah, maybe through wine. I don't think it's officially yeah. available, but we're getting so close. We have Steam now and it's it's getting it's getting to be so exciting on Linux. Steam is a good step. That's mm-hmm. very true. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally I'm a huge Steam user. Um, yeah, that's that's for me. It's just the tools of the trade is is difficult sometimes. Mm-hmm. Audacity, I absolutely love. Um, but my my day to day life is just filled with with things like sketch, uh, you know, for product design. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if you can tell me some open source tools that could really match the stuff that I use day to day, I'm totally open to that. But yeah, I think this is this will be a good project. This is going somewhere. All right. Veronica Belmont on Twitter at Veronica. The podcast is IRL because online life is real life. Subscribe wherever you get your best podcast. First episode coming June 26th. IRL podcast dot org on Twitter at IRL the podcast. Veronica, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the Ask Noah show. We'll get get you back on the program real soon. Thank you very much for having me. This was fun. It was fun. And, uh, you know, especially if we switch her to Linux, right? <laughs> just watch me do my thing. She has no idea what she might have just gotten herself into. Phone lines are open, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's 1-855-450-6624. And I want to stop and just, before we go any further in the program, a huge thanks to Greg Wright and his team here at Greg Wright Law Offices for letting us letting us turn their conference room into a broadcast studio. It uh, it's been uh, it's been it's very kind of them and uh, has fundamentally enabled us to do the show. Even though I uh, had a lot of work to get done this week, and so the huge thanks. If you guys uh, if you guys are in the Wisconsin area, hopefully you don't have a personal injury or criminal matter. But if you do, check them out. Uh, GregWrightLaw.com. That's Greg Wright W R I G H T Greg Wright Law. Dot com. All right, again, phone lines 1 855 450 NOAA 450 6624. And today we're going to do something a little special. I have been on the Reddit and I've been watching what you guys are saying and uh, following up. And I, I try and stop there at least once a week, sometimes more often. If I see somebody that needs help and I don't think they're going to get it any other way, I, you know, I try and take the time to, uh, to, to throw up a response. But you know, the, the primary driving content to this show is phone calls. So I really need you guys to call in. You guys are doing a great job. The phone lines are stacked tonight. We're going to get to the calls here in just a couple minutes. But we are going to try something new tonight. If you guys are on the internet and you don't have a way to call in, but you have a question that you really want answered here on the air, um, we're going to try and accomplish that tonight. So we're going to try something new. Um, Send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. The truth is, I love Mumble, I love email, I love IRC, and y'all know how much I love Telegram, but the reality is that to make this radio show work, there is an industry around how this show needs to be done. The equipment, the setup, the way the calls are screened, the way the calls are handled, the way the calls are routed, everything is based around the fact that despite the fact that we release the show as a podcast for you, the fundamental form of the show, the nature of the show, the inspiration of the show, the function of the show, the the, the foundation of it, I mean, the techniques, it's all traditional FM broadcast radio. Um, so that said, I do want to be inclusive of everyone that can't call in. So send us an email live at asknoahshow.com, and I'm going to have the feed up here on my laptop, and uh, if, you, if you send in a concise question, we will try to answer it for you. I'm not promising this is going to be a permanent thing, but it's something I want to try. So if you're listening live, uh, if you're not listening live, then use the contact forms. But if you're hearing this, uh, if you're hearing this live and you want to ask a question live at asknoahshow.com. All right, let's get back to the phones. You guys are, uh, you guys are hot tonight. Otis is calling from Indiana. Hi, Otis. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. How can we help today? Yeah, uh, actually, I mainly had a question about when you first started Alta Speed, how was it that you were able to keep your clientele up with offering them open source solutions? Mm. How how did I keep clientele up when I was uh, offering, pushing free and open source solutions, competing with the big guys, competing with the uh, the proprietary guys, where they have the built in profit margins and stuff like that, right? Well, yeah. um, 
basically, you know, you st- every business, every successful business does one thing very, very well, and that is that they fill a need. They find a need and they fill it. And if you are not finding a need and serving someone, um, then you are not going to succeed long term in in business, you know, this idea that um, that we find somebody with a need and we serve them and then they reward us with things called dollars, you know, that's been that's been kind of the way I've approached things from the beginning. And so when I sit down with a client, I am personally invested in helping that client succeed and making sure that we do a good job for that client. There is more than once I have, I mean, this week is a, is a perfect example of this, right? Like there are times where I don't sleep for hours on end. There are times when I don't eat for, uh, you know, a day, you know, if that's what it takes, um, because I'm completely invested in that client and I am completely there to walk alongside that client to make sure that I am making decisions with them the same way I would make it for myself. And it was funny, I was sitting with them some of the staff here from from this client that I'm that is so kindly hosting the podcast tonight. We're walking through a series of issues that we've been facing this week, and um, one of the things that kept coming out of my mouth is I would have to stop and I'd think about something, and they'd say, "Well, what should we do?" And I'd stop and I'd think, and I go, "Okay, what would I do? What would I do? Here's what I would do. Here's what I would do." And then I would explain, you know, how they should go forward, and and that 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 ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and not just advise them in how do I make a sale, how do I make a buck. You don't worry about any of that. You identify their needs and you serve them. And in doing that, it will ultimately be profitable because people want to pay to get good service. They're happy to write a check. So how does how does free and open source tie into that? We know having used both because I don't think there's anyone out there that is using free and open source software that hasn't tried proprietary software. In fact, they probably started on prior proprietary software and came over to the free and open source world. So why did they do that? What things drew them over there? Well, they liked having their computer be stable. They liked their computer being secure. They liked the fact that they weren't fighting for uh, activation keys and license keys. That is literally occupied a disproportionate amount of my day when I'm trying to solve problems and I'm hit by these mosquito bites, idiotic things like software activation, right? And, and it has, they have real world consequences. I mean, at a certain amount of time, the software vendor will cut you off. You can't continue your work. And so you start looking at all those things and you start identifying, these are the reasons that I made these decisions. So if a client asks me, what would I do in this situation? I'm going to tell him or her, this is, this is what I would do and this is why I would do it. And what I found is nine out of 10 times, when you explain something, as long, once you have built trust with your client, your client is going to follow your lead and they're going to follow your suggestions because they trust you. I give you, a, I give you an example. You talked about how did I get started? How did, how did you know, what, what, were, what were the first days like? One of the first clients I ever had, um, it was a hotel and I'd never done Wi-Fi before. I'd never done, um, I'd done some structured wiring, but not much. And a uh, client asked me and he said, uh, we bought all these access points. We want you to install them for us. And I said, okay. So I went over to the hotel and I, I put the access points in and I, I set them up and I configured them and system didn't work right. Nothing was working right. And his clients were dropping off and, you know, these were some Chinese access points that they had bought in, you know, off of eBay or something like that. And uh, they weren't working right. And there was no, I couldn't even set the channels on them. So there was, you know, everything was set to channel, you know, one or six or something. I think they had two and you couldn't choose. It was terrible. And um, what ended up happening was I said, I realized I couldn't go back to the client and say, you need to spend, you know, $500 on these access points, these new access points, the ones that I know will work well for them, right? So I went back out and I said, listen, here's the thing. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to take you for a ride or anything. I, I legitimately think there's something wrong with the equipment you've purchased, or I don't think it's very good quality. And I think that's why this isn't going very well for you. So here, here's what I want to do. I will give you uh, the access points to do one hallway. I will give you five of them. I will set them up the way that I think they should be set up. I will let you keep them for six months. If after six months you think that this solved your problem and it is that is absolutely the way to go, then you can come back and write me a check. If you don't like it and you, you don't think it was worth it or I didn't solve the problem or you, you, you still think I'm, I'm, I'm tugging your leg, you call me, I'll come pick the access points back up and I'll put your old ones back in. Um, and what I did was I, I essentially, I bought myself trust because he knew I wasn't out to screw him. If I was out to screw him, I'd just take his money and leave, right? I wasn't interested in that. What I was interested in was earning his business for the long haul. And the way you do that is by serving people well. Sometimes that means you have to give a sample away. Uh, in the, and I did it in the case of a product, and I didn't have a lot of money. So back then, let me tell you, $500 in equipment, that was a 
big chunk of change for me. But you could do it in a smaller way. You could um, go offer to, uh, you know, hand a card out that says you'll do uh, three hours of service for free. In fact, we used to have, we still have the cards. I don't think we give them out very much anymore, but it says um, it's two free hours of, uh, of service. And we just, we hand the, if I see somebody on an airplane and they have a computer problem, or if I, if I run into somebody, I'll hand those cards out and I say, you know, here, give us a call. Um, and that's a way to get your foot in the door. And that's a way to, to, to show somebody that you care about their problems as much as they do and that you're worthy of their trust. And then what you have the opportunity to, to do is once you get your foot in the door, then you can prove you're so valuable that they can't let you go. And so when you go into a client and you say, listen, this is the software I know is going to work really well to keep your your business up and running, they're going to say, yeah, you know what? I, I, you, you've, you've been right so far. And, and then it builds. And then people start to talk. And once people start to talk, it takes off like wildfire because people start to go, oh, this guy, he, he's not inter- he's, he's never He never wants to have a conversation about the money. He always wants to have a conversation about us and what, what the problems are and how do we fix them. And then the money thing comes later. In fact, I don't even deal with the finance anymore. I pay people to do that. It's, just, it's totally off of my radar. Does that, that's a really long answer to your question, but does that kind of give you some perspective? No, yeah, they gave me a lot to think about and uh, how to proceed forward, you know, following some of your tips and tricks because you've already traversed that route. So it's definitely a beautiful yeah. roadmap to get started. Okay, great. Yeah. And I mean, if there's ever anything else I can do, if I can answer any other questions or if you want, uh, you know, anything more specific, you know, just uh, reach out to me on, on Telegram or email and I'd be, I'd be happy to provide you any advice I can. Um, you know, one of the hard things to navigate when you're first getting started is what software do you use? What hardware do you use? Um, because you want to recommend good things to your clients. And if you need any help with that, you give us a call or call me back on the air and I'd be happy to answer that for you. Tyler is calling from California. Hi, Tyler. Welcome to the Ask No Show. Hello. How are you doing? Hi. Excellent. How are you? Good. So my question is, is buying um, a, a, compu- a computer or, <clears throat> or laptop from a dedicated Linux computer manufacturer like Purism or System76 better or worse than buying, for example, a... A, compu- uh, a larger computer manufacturer that mainly uses Windows and then buying that and installing Linux from that. Sure. Is it better to buy a computer from a dedicated Linux manufacturer rather than buying from an OEM um, that's primarily there to serve Linux? Well, obviously, the answer to that question is it depends on what you're trying to accomplish with the computer. Certainly, if you want a smooth experience on Linux, um, yes, you're probably going to have a better time. Uh, you're going to have a guaranteed better time if you're buying from a, from a manufacturer like System76. That's what they built their name on. They built their name on serving people well that want a good experience on Linux. Now, here's where I deviate from, as I own a lot of System76 computers, Tyler, so I, you know, I, I'm a big fan of their products, I'm a big fan of their hardware uh, you know, lineup, and when I have a client that I think would fit really well, you know, they're one of the first people I go to to recommend. Here's where I would stay, here's where I would, I would deviate from that. If you have a very low budget, um, if you don't have a lot of money, and, and, the, and, it, and your choice is going to, and your choice of which computer you're going to buy potentially prohibits you from purchasing a, you know, a usable machine to begin with, and you're going to have a, a, you know, a bad experience, I would go and, uh, I would go and purchase something like a used ThinkPad, you know, a used Dell, both of these, all computers in the last 10 years really have standardized around the Intel chipset. And so that means that your sound card is almost always going to work out of the box. Your network card's almost always going to work out of the box, display, so on and so forth. I don't know if I've had a computer in the last 10 years that hasn't worked perfectly out of the box. And all, you know, even when I'm buying it from regular OEM manufacturers, um, does that, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, and um, I actually have a Galica Pro right next to me, and my my mother's touch screen, she she's been using Windows 10. It's a Lenovo, uh, like a Lenovo touch screen, and when I install mm-hmm. Ubuntu on it, it doesn't seem to use touch screen. So she so she wants her touch screen, but there's it's like a two in one tablet where you can like flip it over, and it, it just mm-hmm. won't work. So um. I'm wondering if, if that was a better option. 
Yeah, I'll tell you what, uh, Dell actually has, and Rakai's pointing this out in the chat room actually as well, Dell is actually one of the companies that is really taking Linux seriously. In fact, they've redesigned many of their lineups to offer uh, a Linux on it, and, and, and in some cases exclusively, like the, the XPS Developer Edition is exclusively offered with Linux, and they are seeing such an uptick in people that are purchasing Linux to run their business or to, you know, to do development on. Um, what I would do is I would reach out to Dell and ask them and say, see if there is any, uh, you know, Linux support for that. They may have a custom distro for it. Or you could try the Sputnik, uh, you know, distro and see if that has some support. I know it did have some support for touchpads on the earlier XPS models that the stock Ubuntu installed didn't have. Um, you can also, of course, post, post the model on, on an online forum and, uh, and, and, and they would, you know, there might be somebody able to help you. I don't suppose you have the model handy. Um, I actually, I do right now. Let's see. Yeah, it is. What is it? Well, just uh, I think, yeah, this on the is back a, of the computer, bottom of the. Yeah, this is an XPS two years ago, XPS, I think like 10. Okay. Well, yeah, here's the thing. To the best of my knowledge, to the best of my knowledge, all of the hardware, uh, it, it, all the har- all the XPS line is is uh, hardware enabled for Linux. I tell you what I'm going to do, Tyler. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you back on hold. I'm going to have Sarah. She's going to pick up. She's going to take down your particulars, and I will reach out to some of my contacts at Dell, and we'll see if we can't get an answer for you because I'm pretty sure that computer should work right off the bat uh, without having to do a whole lot to it. Rick is with us from California. Hi, Rick. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, I wanted to know. Uh, how do you format external uh, hard drives and flash drives? Because I've tried a few things like um, Gparted, Gnome Disk, MKFS, all of them. They leave the hard drive uh, just readable. I can't write anything to them. Mm. I was wondering what you use. Uh, well, typically I use Gnome Disks. I will tell you that if you're having trouble with all three, you, you just you rattled off all three programs I was about to tell you and I almost in the same order. I was going to say try Gnome Disk because it's already there. Try Gparted because it's easy to get to and try MakeFS because it just always works. Uh, and if you're having trouble with all three of those, I'd say you have bad hardware. I would see, uh, have you tried formatting something else? Like uh, tried to format a, a different flash media drive? Uh, yeah, so I've tried a bunch of different uh, flash drives. Uh, I've tried a couple different, on a couple different computers. It's the same problem. It seems like a uh, it works if I do uh, NTFS. It'll work okay. But if I try and format mm. it to like EXV4, XFS, it doesn't work. It's not a Western Digital external hard drive, is it? No. No. Um, I have seen, I've run into some problems lately with uh, the firmware that's on some of the external USB drives. Um, and, uh, there's, there are some, uh, little fixes for it in, in Linux, but I, I, you know, I haven't, uh, I've, ne- I've only seen that on Western digital. I've not seen that outside of it. So I, I, I guess I don't, I guess I, I, I mean, I, I, I revert to my earlier answer. I think you must have defective hard, you know, hardware. I, I've never had a, I've never had not been able to use one of those three utilities. I suppose you could try it on a different install too. Um, uh, you know, have you? Uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess that's what I would do. I would try just I would try on a different uh, on a you know on a live media or something. Try on a different piece of live media and see if that works. But uh, otherwise, I would say it might be something uh, might be an issue with uh, with your uh, hardware. Um, do who? This is great. So many calls. I don't even know who to take next. Uh, let's go to Blue. Blue is calling. Hi, Blue. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah. Hey, how can uh, we help? Uh, my question is, what do you? What, what would you recommend? I've been using graph stock, uh, graphic stock, like super broadcasting. But all my clients want me to find something better for stock, uh, stock photos, those, and I can't think of anything that is as close to graphic stock that I can think of, and I thought you would probably know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I use graphic stock quite a bit. Uh, I use uh, graphic stock. I use uh, you know video block stuff like that. Um, Honestly, if you want the highest quality uh, art, highest quality photography, highest quality you know visual production, I use a company called Visex, Visuex. 
Um, it's uh, visual excellence. Basically, what they do is they will custom design anything for you. Um, and they're the ones that do all of my stuff for Alta Speed. They do all the stuff for Ask Noah Show. Um, is the owner of the company, uh, Michael Tunnell, great friend of mine, probably in the chat room right now. But I would give them a call, visuex.com, uh, and I would see what they, you know, you work with, the, work with their team and see if they don't have an answer for you. Is it, This is for a client, you said, for your work? Yes, different funeral homes and a couple of non-funeral homes who are mm-hmm. been wanting me to do graph, uh, special event photos who's for holidays. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I... I, I um... Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, that's what I, that's what I would do. I would. I don't know if you're going to find much better than graphics. I mean, you could. There's also there are some uh, community submitted artwork sites, community submitted photography sites. You can check. You can Google those. Uh, those aren't bad. Um, but uh, yeah, I I usually I'll use a I'll use a stock image site, and if I can't find something in a stock image site that I want or that I want to use, I need something else. Then I will. Uh, then I'll just I'll just I'll contact Visuex and just tell him hey I I need this and yeah I I've yet to him not meet a timeline him not meet and exceed an expectation I mean usually his stuff is you know above and beyond what what you could ever imagine and uh, he's really great to work with so Visuex that's what I would recommend as do Alex Jamaica welcome to the Ask Noah show Jamaica hey Alex how are you doing are you hearing me I can. Thanks for calling in from Jamaica. How can we help? Definitely. Um, no, this is not really a call to say, you know, for assistance. It's just to say thanks and give you guys kudos in, in the amount of work you guys are doing, especially on the Jupiter Broadcasting mm-hmm. Network. And also, you know, to let you know, like, how open source has been going on in Jamaica, my neck of the world. Great. Well, That's fantastic. So, and you, are you yeah. using Linux and open source? Oh, yeah, definitely. I'm running um, Ubuntu um, 16.04. I'm also doing a small one um, on another left environment, running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so, you know, fun, fun. one of the things that actually interested me was the, was the fact that um, you did this cool thing with the running around with a flash drive and try to get open source installed on a um, different folks' machine within a couple of days. Um, mm-hmm. So... In my in Jamaica, um, I started something similar to that, but it's not as fancy as yours. Um, basically, what I do started doing is to go around to primary schools that that within my community um, to actually install sure. operating systems um, with Ubuntu on them and so forth, and distribute um, some Raspberry Pi computers. And thus far, folks are actually enjoying the use of those. Um, How on a fun. broader scale. Yeah, on a broader scale, the government is actually doing more open source policy in terms of um, there's a couple of library services that we're using here in Jamaica. Um, those are run on open source. Um, there is also some policies that's going to come into play, which are going to make the government save more money with the use of technology. And a lot of those government websites that we have here are actually running on Drupal as well. Mm. So... Yeah, I'm just giving you an overview. A lot of stuff going on. And um, I'm not sure if you heard about, like, in Cuba, they have their own um, Linux operating system as well. Right? So Really? But we're like, yeah, definitely. I think it's called Nova. Um, I'll probably get to okay. the name of that one. But, um, yeah. But it, open source has been really good to me. And, you know, I've been giving back um, to the community and helping folks you know, to use it more and become, uh, make it become part of the, the business um, environment more often as opposed to just being developer focused. So, Outstanding. Yeah, keep well, thank up the you good very much. Thank- yeah, yeah, thank you for All what right. you're doing. We really appreciate it. You know, you know, you've got friends here at the Ask Noah Show, so if there's anything we can do to help you out in Jamaica, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call back. And again, I know you're calling, you know, a long way, so we'll try and get you on the air as fast as possible. Yeah, that's cool. Call from Jamaica. Brian is calling from South Carolina. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. Thanks for taking my call. Yes, sir. How can we help today? I'm running a Ubuntu 17.04, and I'm got a right channel speaker problem left channel works fine and it dual boots so in windows 10 it works fine on both speakers um 
done a little Google search and basically said open the awesome mixer in terminal and make sure all of the volumes are equal. Tried that and I'm still having a right channel problem. Any suggestions? Yeah, so I, a couple actually. So have you tried uh, Pavu control or Pavu control? I don't exactly know how to pronounce it. No, I have not. I'll have a link for you in the show notes. Uh, I have had issues where sometimes also mixer won't work and Pavu control will. And I, I, I'd be the first to admit, I am not a audio subsystem expert or whatever. So I, I'm probably not, you know, I'm, I'm not, not the, the world's foremost expert on, on audio issues, but I have had some weird things. In fact, my wife's laptop, her new yoga, um, had a very similar issue. It wasn't that the, it was a left channel only would work, but it just, the volume was not on at all. And also mixer wouldn't work. Pavu control would get us what we needed. We were able to turn that back up. So that's, what thing one I would try. Here's thing two. Uh, if you got an extra five bucks or seven bucks, they have these little USB um, audio devices on on Amazon. I'll get, have a link. And I'm not suggesting that you use this as a permanent fix, but it can be a very good troubleshooting step because what, you can, what you'll determine is it, we know that these devices work well with Linux. So if you plug one of these USB devices in, and your problem goes away, then you know that it's definitely something specific to the hardware. If you, you know, your hardware with Linux, I shouldn't say hardware because we know it works, you know, in other operating system. But if it doesn't work, then there may be something actually misconfigured with your Linux operating system itself. Does that make sense to you? It there sure does. I appreciate the help. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So we'll have a link for both those things in the show notes. You can check those out again, show notes. Um, if you go to asknoshow.com, we have links there to where you can download the show and, and, uh, watch the show, uh, you know, in video format, not that there's a lot to see there's chat room. Um, but we also have the show notes for every episode. Uh, okay. We can't do a show without sweet Lou, sweet Lou, sweet Lou. Hi, sweet Lou. How's it going? Hey, how's it going? All right. Hey, pretty good. How can we help today, Sweet Lou? Um, yeah. I was just wondering. Um, I'm going to be meeting with somebody uh, this week about uh, taking videos uh, off of uh, one website and uploading them to uh, YouTube. Yeah, but I'm just mm-hmm. asking in general, what do you think is the best uh, video download tool available out there right now for, uh, for at least Linux? Yeah. For downloading YouTube videos on Linux? Uh, well, videos off of any site. And at YouTube, mm. Daily Motion, even the smaller video sites. Okay. Well, so I tell you, for YouTube, obviously, the the answer is obvious. Obviously, we use YouTube DL. It's just a great program. Great program. I, can't have an, I don't have enough good things to say about YouTube DL. Easy, simple to use, quick to use, very good program. For anything else, I use an extension on Firefox called Video Download Helper. And uh, it basically, it has like, I, all I remember about it is it has like red, right, and blue, like triangle balls that like <laughs> has been around. It's just the weirdest thing. But it is a really cool tool. It's a really neat thing. And basically, anytime you go to a video that has, or a website that has embedded video, the uh, video download helper will scan that website, find the, uh, all of the available formats that you can download it in and let you download it. And I, I've had great luck. In fact, that's what I used all the time before I started using uh, YouTube DL. And um, and actually, Rick Heist told me in the chat room, YouTube DL actually supports thousands of sites. So it actually, you might just be able to use YouTube DL, you know, straight up. And, and that's probably what I would do, uh, to be honest with you. That's really probably what I would do. Again, phone lines, one 855 450 NOAA, 855-450-6624. A huge thank you to you guys for... Uh, supporting the show man i you know i don't know what it is you know tonight everyone is uh, is you know is we did almost a whole show just on calls and i tell you what we ever get to a part, point where we can do a whole show with calls i'll stop talking and i'll just let you guys take over and and ask the questions and we'll just answer and that's you know i would I would not mind that at all now i'm a big fan of course of bacula i'm a big fan of crash plan i'm a big fan of rsync which is what i personally use on all of my machines for a backup strategy but this week I've been dealing with one heck of a backup scenario, and I'd love if you guys would send in your favorite backup strategies this week and next week. Maybe we'll dedicate an entire episode to backup and recovery. Of course, at the heart of any good, really good server failure is a Windows server that we inherited from a previous IT company. Now, in ultra speed fashion, of course, we sat down with the client. We advised them that we're going to be transitioning into a more stable platform. But before we could get there, we had a failure of Windows. And Windows does what it does best, and it bit the dust hard. Um, Now, despite the problems that we're facing, and you've always got to look at the upside. 
And so we've got a T620 in service with a RAID 5 array and a squeaky clean install of CentOS 7 with Libvirt de-virtualizing the rest of their infrastructure. So from this point on, um, restoration is just a rollback command away, which is a really cool thing if you actually think about it. I mean, if you think about this from a broad perspective, and again, disaster aside, disasters are no good. We don't like problems, but um, we're sitting pretty right now. With Libra D, I literally have the same console level access from my laptop on site as I would with an internet connection anywhere in the world. So yesterday, uh, after we got done uh, working, I went out to dinner and uh, we were sitting there eating. I had my laptop with me. No. What's that? What are you doing? We're at dinner. What are you doing with your laptop? And of course, you know, it's me. It's dinner. Of course, I take my laptop. But now I'm just reinstalling the operating system on your workstations. Said, Wait, what? You're doing what? How can you do that on your laptop? Well, you know, the laptop and a hotspot, I can, I can literally do it anywhere. So there's, there's no difference being on site or being remote once everything is sitting inside of the hypervisor, right? So that's something that you have to think about the next time. And so, you know, just going back to that earlier call, that's something that you have to think about when the next time somebody asks you, you know, when you're thinking about what's the best way to get these people on Linux. Well, what we've done here is we've moved all of the heavy lifting infrastructure to Linux servers. So for the Windows applications that are needed, they're virtualized appliances. We've turned Windows from something that we rely on to just a computer program. We can turn it off, we can turn it on, we can restart it, we can reinstall it if we need to. Linux excels at certain things and Windows excels at certain things. Linux excels when it comes to security, reliability, and stability. Windows excels where it comes to software compatibility. So if you put your software compatible OS on a virtual machine that's sitting on top of a Linux hypervisor, well, now you're really cooking with gas in the front right burner. And, um, you know, I do say, not if, when. I say if, or I say it when, not if, Windows dies again, then we're just going to roll the machine back and we'll put whatever data, we'll pull whatever data we need off of it. And we have what we call sterile copies of the, uh, of the virtual machine. So basically what we do is we set everything up the way we want it and we make a copy of that VM image. And um, so when we get a call from a, uh, when we get a call from a, user and they say we have a problem, what we do is we SSH in, drop to a command prompt, and we just RM, you know, VM7, and then copy sterile VM7, and then, uh, you know, we just we just tell the client, hey, you know, now you're back up and running. And uh, we can do that in like five seconds, ten seconds. And again, that's that's assuming we're not just, you know, taking care of everything with a rollback feature that's built into LibVirt D. It's a really cool system. LibVirt D is really awesome. I did, we did one episode of LASS on it. Maybe it's something we'd have to dig into a little bit on, on Ask Noah too, but never had a bad experience with it. It's always been rock solid and uh, is solving a lot of problems. Nathaniel's calling from West Virginia. Hi, Nathaniel. Welcome to the Ask Noah show. Hi, Noah. Good to speak with you. Good to speak with you too. How can we help, sir? Well, uh, I'm a long time sort of now listener of last and, and, and after the fork. Um, and you guys have basically converted me uh, from a Mac fanboy to um, to a Linux user. So I went all in and I bought right. uh, the first work. I'm notching my boot right now. You can't see it, but I am. <laughs> and I even told I even told Emma that you switched me to Linux and she got a kick out of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, so what my question is, is I've been occasionally I've tried different distros on it. Um, some of them work okay, mostly the Ubuntu-based ones, but anything else, uh, NVIDIA decides to screw with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you and or Chris, I, I think I thought one of the two of you had one, um, mm -hmm. what your you know sort of horror stories or tips were about, um, you know, I, I was able to get Antidote running on it, um, but uh, Steam won't launch, things like that. So just any, any tips or tricks that you might have about making those transitions smoother. Yeah, so I, you're right. I do have an Oryx Pro and a fa fantastic computer, very powerful machine. Um, and I did put Antragos on it. And I, like you, I had exact same problems. I had problems getting it to run out of the box. What I ended up doing was if you just contact System76, you tell them what you're doing, they will help you. They actually, they gave me a, um, there's a special NVIDIA driver, I think think if I remember right and they gave me something I had to do and I think it was a, a particular version of the NVIDIA driver and I installed that and all of a sudden my problems went away I had similar problems I couldn't have steam launch and eventually it got to a point where I couldn't even log in uh, if I had um, if I had disk encryption enabled I couldn't log in to mm -hmm. unity it would just bounce back yeah it was a real pain um, but yeah, yeah the, having, the, the, what you're I paying for that problem with 
sorry, uh, I was having that problem with Ubuntu before I even put Intro Ghost on it, which was kind of what prompted me. Well, if I if I have to reinstall something, I'll try something else, because um, it was going in that loop where it would log in and then throw me right back out to the uh, to the login page. Yep, yep. I had the same issue. So and what you have to remember, what you're paying. For- Part of what you're paying for with System76 is obviously excellent hardware, but the other thing you're paying for, the real thing you're paying money for, at least what I consider myself paying money for, is I'm paying for the support, the fact that these people are dedicated to Linux. And so I guarantee you, you know, they got engineers that work right inside of System76 that they, they work on, you know, software development, kernel development, driver development, just, you name it, they, they got people doing it. So if you, yeah, I would give them a call and just say, hey, this is not working with Antrigos. And you know what? I'll bet you money, and I don't know this for a fact, I'm just kind of going on a limb, but I'll bet you I'm right. I'll bet you there is somebody right there right now running Antrigos on an Oryx Pro. I'll bet you that's the case. Yeah, give me a call. Give me, do, do this. Give him a call. Yes, it is. I, I don't have Antrigos okay. on my uh, on the Oryx anymore. I have I went back to Ubuntu, but I have I have Antrigos running on my ThinkPad, and uh, the Oryx still is in operation, and it's a it's a fantastic machine. So yeah, give Emma a call. Tell her I, I sent you her way, and um, told her to fix your Linux machine. Uh, because we switched you to Linux. <laughs> uh, I, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so here's a hot tip for you. Older machines, they make great backup servers. In fact, we repurposed some of their old Optiplex 390s um, as three NAS boxes running rsync to have da- disaster recovery here on site. Um, and speaking of older computers that we want to use as servers, I wanted to follow up with Jay from last week who asked about using a Dell workstation with a RAID card in it. Well, the truth is that we all know that the collective audience is way smarter than Noah will ever be. And um, they made sure to tell me after we got off the phone last week, Jay, that your problem is you need a bigger power supply or different power supply. So Jay, hopefully you're listening this week. And if you try a bigger power supply in that Dell workstation with that RAID card, um, the powers that be tell me that is what is going to get the thing working for you. And you won't have the hassle of buying a new card for your machine. So we had suggested that maybe you look into like an external SATA card. Don't do that. Just uh, look into a power supply. At least try it. And a huge, you know, a huge thank you to the audience. Man, you guys are amazing the last week. Uh, a huge thank you to the audience for both catching that. Uh, Jay, give us a call back, 1-855-450-NOAA, 855-450-6624, or live at asknoahshow.com. Let us know how that works out for you, because uh, I'm, I'm, you know, that, that'd be really cool to, uh, to find out. But yeah, thank you, audience, so much for being available and calling in and making a whole show uh, for us tonight. We really appreciate having you. All right, I'm really excited to get into this. Uh, headline, KeyPass XC 2.2.0 released. We are very excited to announce that the release of KeyPass 2.2, we have worked long and hard to bring you lots of new features and bug fixes in the war- well-rounded release. Among the top highlights of this release are a generator for first-time, one-time-based passwords, a Diceware password generator, a command line interface, a CSV database import, and true portable mode with the config file residing in the same directory as the application. And my favorite, wait for it, YubiKey challenge support mode. That is, I, to me, that is the coolest thing ever. Because you know those times when you're baking cookies and you put all the ingredients in except the flour? So instead of eating like cookie dough, you're just eating like the heavenly nectar that is what makes cookies taste good. Well, you can add the tasteless flour in later and then you can actually make the cookies. But this is what we're talking about. This is the this is cookie dough nectar. YubiKey support on my locally stored open source password manager. What more could you ask for in life? You know, I was a LastPass user for quite some time and uh, I got out just in time because now they're charging a yearly fee that's required for two-factor authentication. So password manager without two-factor is less secure than not having a password manager at all. If you think about this, um, I haven't lost my mind. I know some of you think I'm losing my mind saying that, but no, with two-factor authentication, without two-factor authentication, let's just assume that you're, at some point your account is going to get compromised. After all, really, it's just a matter of hacking one account at this point, right? Well, not only do they have the passwords for all of your accounts, they literally have a freaking directory listing of where to find all of your accounts. But no, that's only, it's only $15 a year, whatever it is. I don't care. I don't care if it's 35 cents a year. You're paying a ransom for your password. Shut up. Uh, Roll up your ransom demands, stick them in your ear, and then download KeePassX from KeePassXC.org. But seriously, on a calm note, 
if you are using KeePass X with your YubiKey and C file and all this stuff is on infrastructure you control, and of course you can always call customer care at one 280 1433 and just offload the management of C file onto Ulta Speed, and then you'll literally have all of the same things that you would have with uh, you know, LastPass, except you, you, know, you get a Dropbox replacement on top of it. And of course, at any time, you can always move all of your stuff because it's your infrastructure to your house and have it all local and protected and safe and stable. I am so glad that I got in on the on the uh, the start of this YubiKey thing. They have been on top of their game uh, from the beginning. They offer seriously quality products at an unbelievable cost, and their I mean their stuff has been literally adopted everywhere. It's like every time I turn around, someone in the open source community is is using uh, YubiKey or integrating YubiKey. And I think that's only going to get more and more with the advent of like, uh, you know, a U2F and stuff like that. I just, it's, it, they're really, those, those people are really going places. And uh, now they're integrating into my password manager. As I was talking about that hardware password manager, uh, you know, the other day. And so I, you know, all things are open, but uh, a lot of different ways you could go right now for password management. A lot of different cool things you could do. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of this week's show. We'll be back next Monday at 6 p.m. Central. A huge thanks to Ben, our producer, Sarah, our call screener, Rakai, our video editor. We and you off to Crosspoint coming up next on Logos Radio, KEQQ, 88.3, LPFM, Grand Forks.